Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the live stream. My name's Matt Bailey. You're tuned to another nightly live stream with some June Outturn previews, some previews of what's coming up this Friday in June Outturn. Uh, this is really exciting for me because I get to then taste some of what's coming up in June Outturn. I get to talk about some of what's coming up in Outturn. Um, bring the music. You know what? I got criticized for the music. Good to see you, Justin. Uh, the, the music was a bit much last night. It was a bit sort of cheesy music. So that was a bit of sort of, um, that was a bit of, weird underground kind of um japanese mall music soundtrack that i've got which i quite like uh, it's kind of very it's like ambient kind of music so i thought i'd start with that one tonight thank you everyone for tuning in uh hi mate rowan good to see you mate hope you're well um there's some great stuff in june outturn in fact as i said last night there's some we've had some comments on our on our facebook group and, and elsewhere on twitter and instagram saying this is probably one of the most uh diverse outturns they've seen in a while um it's an absolute banger of an outturn, as someone else said. Um, it's a really diverse list of interesting bottlings. Last night, we explored Malt of the Month, the 17-year-old single cask from Distillery 9, 9.191. Uh, an incredible value single cask 17-year-old whiskey uh, for one ninety nine in outturn. I think that's fantastic. Um, I, look, I'm, I'm biased. I, th I think it's a fantastic value bottling, but we've seen... We've seen, uh, you know, 12 and 10-year-old uh, whiskeys in that price range uh, of Scotch whiskeys, I should say. I mean, new old whiskey always has a bit of a different price structure. That's another discussion for another time. But I have uh, in front of me two or three or four bottlings just off to the camera here um, of other things in June Outturn that I thought I might make a moment tonight to talk about some of what they are, uh, what to expect, uh, what to look out for, what you might find interesting, what you might want to jump on. Now, one of them that I'm going to taste right away at the start is the only non-peated one in this lineup, actually. Uh, it's the 128.14 Dark Chocolate Cremo. Now, this is a Welsh whiskey, a seven-year-old full maturation, second fill, ex Oloroso butt. Let's examine some of those stats before I pour it. Deep, rich and dried fruits flavor profile uh, from Wales, distilled June 2013 and matured in a second fill ex Oloroso butt. So it's Oloroso, it's ex sherry, it's a type of sherry maturation. The most two commonly used ones in Scotch whiskey are Oloroso and PX. Uh, this is an Oloroso one. I prefer Oloroso matured sherry whiskies over PX ones, just by a smidge, but they're they're very different. And the distillate will play, will play a role in in shaping that spirit anyway. And then it's sixty one point four percent, and it's from a butt, so uh, meaning it's from a, a large sherry butt. Whiskey is my jam. Uh, good to see you, mate. I'm just opening this bottle of 128.14 Dark Chocolate Cremo. I didn't bring up, actually, a photo of it. Um, where are we? So we can have a look. Uh, there's some other great things happening in Outturn. You can, I can show you on the screen now. Winter Cocktails with the Society. Great article, which features some of our fantastic partner bars. 9.191 is what I featured last night. Um <laughs> Uh, evening, everyone. James Finnegan, good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Whiskey is my jam. Good to see you, Darren Howie. Evening, Captain Matt. Good to see you, Darren. Hope you're well. Thank you for tuning in. We've just we've just kicked off the stream by saying last night we looked at nine dot one nine one malt of the month, and tonight we're looking we're starting with dark chocolate cremo from a Wales distillery. Now I've just taken the cap off that seal off that. Let's have a look. Now I'm gonna do what Andrew never does because I, I I I subscribe to his thoughts on this actually. Nosing from a bottle doesn't really tell you anything about a whiskey. So I'm going to pour a little bit of this into the glass. Oh, it's dark. It's quite dark in color. It is full sherry maturation. Uh, you would expect it to be. Um, so just not to confuse anyone, up on screen I'll show you. There's the distillery. It's kind of contemporary looking because it is contemporary looking. I think it was founded around, uh, I'm going to get the date wrong. It's like 2006 or something like that. Um, but this distillery, starting with P in Wales, uh, is one of only three or four distilleries making whiskey in um, in Wales. There's a few other gin distilleries and whatnot, but these guys really spearheaded the resurgence, if you like, the rebirth of Welsh whiskey. Um, this distillery is absolutely one to watch. Yeah, I agree, Justin. I, there's there's a few sort of I, I always call them world distilleries. Anything I sort of you know outside of Scotch whiskey, I often say you know world distillery. I think that's a bit unfair of a, a blanket statement, but it, I think this is one to watch. I mean, I. Uh, I'll be I'll be the first to admit uh, I am not have never really been enamored with their core range. Uh, I've always that they're often bottled at forty one percent, so it's a strange proof. It's quite low as well. Uh, they don't carry a whole lot of um, flavor. Look, that's it is quite dark. It's like 
burnished brasso or conkers or something or an old wooden chest in color. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, indeed. Wow, we. Straight away, uh, straight away, like dark chocolate notes, like lint, uh, but like 70% lint, not that 85 or 95% crazy stuff. I knew this one would be too good to resist. Yeah, I had to look, Jesse. The consensus was G15.8 last night, um, but I'm going to go with 128.14. I might open the G15 as well tonight, see how we go. Oh, I've also got something else which people were asking about uh, last night, so I'm going to taste that as well after this. No, Darren, this is X Oloroso. So this is full maturation in X Oloroso, second fill as well. So this is really interesting to note. Second fill, third fill, like second fill and refill. At the Society, we, wherever possible, try and use the words second fill for second fill and refill for third fill. Um, that's just sort of like Scotch whiskey terminology. Uh, we don't really use the words third fill. Uh, we use second fill. Um, but there you go. <laughs> SMWS releases out shining the OBs. Unheard of. <laughs> I know it's not, it doesn't make much sense comparing OBs to SMWS releases. That's why I generally don't. I mean, making those sort of comparisons doesn't tell you anything about the whiskey. But I, I thought I'd have a bit of fun with it tonight. Um, and like I said, I've had the opportunity to taste a bunch of the OB releases. They do a port cask, I think a sherry cask and an ex-bourbon cask. 41% uh, they always bottle that, which is, again, I think a, a strange decision. But um, And this one is 61.4, seven-year-old. This would be about the same age, if not a little bit older than their core range as well. So you get to sort of experience what that what's that like it from a single cask, no less as well. So it yielded, being a sherry, but quite a few bottles, 612 bottles after seven years, not too much angel share going on there. Um, I foolishly thought this may be an outturn to sit back and let the uh, bank balance recharge being proven wrong with each one of these tastings. <laughs> Matt, you, Jesse, you're very welcome, I think. I, um, look, it's true. I mean, they, we like to call the June outturn a little bit of a sleeper because it's not a big, it's not a bombastic outturn. May is bombastic. May is festival month. July is big. This is championship month coming up in July. Uh, the champs, by the way, the champs have sold out. Like, I mean, that like well and truly sold out. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk too much about champs because if you did miss out on a ticket and I start talking about it, it's gonna it's gonna erupt. I'm sorry. Um, um, thanks. You're welcome, Darren. Yeah, um, Distillery 128 is is one of the Taz SNVS State Managers' favorites. Tom Roth. Ah, Tom, good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Um, Tom, you're gonna love this. You're gonna absolutely love this. Um, it's super clean on the nose, and what I mean by that is like there's not a hint of like cask sulfur, and I that's a good thing. I'm really, I mean, I, I would wager that Andrew uh, Andrew Derbidge, our cellar master, is extremely sensitive to sulfur. He can pick up on it really quickly, and I think that's a really good thing to be able to do. Some people have what I like to call a sulfur blind spot. They can't spot sulfur at all. I'm also equally as envious of them because they can't, if, if you can enjoy a heavily sulfured whiskey and it's not, uh, and it doesn't bother you, then great. I mean, great, but this doesn't have it at all. Um, uh, where are we up to? Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, talking about champs. Congrats to the SMWS for Carpe Diem cleaning up. You know what? You know why I think that's really good news, uh, Darren, is because I tasted Carpe Diem. It was one of our virtual tastings, if you recall, only like two months ago. Um, and I and I said to Andrew, this is quite possibly the best 53 we've I've ever had. Like, I mean, I mean that, like, hands down, one of the best 53s, if not the very best 53 I've ever had. And I, I've, I've, ta I've tasted 53.3 and 53.5 in my travels. And so then those were both 1970s casks. I mean, they were great. But the 53.322 for me was like just otherworldly good. And I said that to Andrew. I said it has possibly the best nosing whiskey we've seen uh, in, in ages. And it was just one of those things like a real sort of uh, a real um, pearl, a real pearl in the oyster, if you like. I don't know how, what, whatever metaphor you want me to use, but it was, it was sort of like a fantastic whiskey that, it was very well deserving. And the best part about that for us, really, is that when these awards come out, when you hear about these luxury masters and um, the independent uh, bottling uh, uh, competition and um, Scotch whiskey masters like this one, when we hear about these awards, they've often been from casks that have been submitted to that awards show uh, for analysis many, many months, if not even a year ahead. And so being able to have some bottles of Carpe Diem available for members who go, that's, that's taken up top gong. It's not, that's not like the top of the society one. 
That's the top award of that of those awards. That's massive. So the highest scoring whiskey was the one that we actually have seven bottles left of on the site. It is not a cheap bottling by anyone's standards. It's just a smidge over a thousand dollars, but it is a um, it, it's it's a fantastic drop. It's one that you would open, and you would be able to if you were, if you were measured with your pores, you could actually let that sit for. You could open it and share it around on special occasions for two to three years. I think that's well worth the investment of something that good. Uh, I recently tried Oloroso uh, to find it was unsweetened. That's right. And the uh, Oloroso cask season whiskey traditionally not sweet like sherry. Um, I presumed it was typically a sweet wine in the same family as port. I wouldn't I wouldn't say even port's a sweet wine per se. I'd say port's just a it's a it's a very good fortified. Um but Oloroso isn't I mean there's sweet Oloroso, there is sweet Oloroso and there's dry Oloroso. There's there's different types of Oloroso as well. I could we should do I should do a full um I should do a full stream like a, an educational one on 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 sherry. It would be really good actually. You know what? I'm going to do that. Let's I'll get that scheduled in for next week. That'll be really fun to just do a, a full stream talking about sherry and I'll open up a few sherries and have a taste of a few things. Um Lee, that's going to be intriguing for a lot of people. I've had a taste of it. We featured it at the um, Sydney event last week. Uh, and it was, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's very like, it's hugely uh, spicy and aromatic. It, it is, you can, you can taste the beer influence. And I think, uh, I didn't get a chance to do this with it when I tasted it, but if you could taste the, if you could pair that with an IPA, that'd be something else. That'd be so good. Okay. So let's have a nose and let's have a taste of this. Oh, Wow. The nose is pure sherry, but the palate, oh, the palate is like, um, like, like ginger snaps, rum cake and ginger snaps, and um, and uh, praline like uh, Gillian seashells, oh, like that, yeah, Gillian seashells and um, a bit of rum cake as well. That's something else. I tell you what, it's a, it's a ball breaker at sixty one point four percent, but it it doesn't drink at sixty one point four. I mean, it's you can tell it's high. If you if I was to blind guess that proof, I'd say it's around a 57, 56. Um, Lee, uh, sorry, uh, Jesse says uh, a feather from the angels and uh, maybe an alternative to uh, <laughs> to, to pearl. I agree. Carbo Dan was heavenly. Such a wonderful opportunity you offered with uh, from the vaults tasting. Yeah. It was so good to taste that from that vault's tasting box as well. Um, it was it was a really special um, tasting that vault's tasting because it's not often the reason why we put that vault's tasting together. That was like February or March from memory. I think it was March. Uh, the reason we put that together was because uh, we we sort of went. Andrew and I talked about it, and we're like, it's not often we have five vaults collection bottlings available at the same time. And it was like. It, was, it would be an awesome opportunity to taste these with members around the country. And, you know, it's just like there's often lockouts at the moment in you know Adelaide or Perth or Melbourne that things keep moving a re- little bit at the moment. And so we're keeping our virtuals going, and we've discussed this before. I mean, we're going to keep them going regardless uh, because we it's there's members who don't live in the CBDs, who don't live in the city to be able to get to tastings regularly. Uh, and we want to make sure that if you're at home, you can enjoy these amazing whiskeys. We can host them and, and share them, share the joy with you. That's all it's about. But tonight is all about the 128.14 to start with, the um, the Welsh whiskey, dark chocolate cremo. I've got a photo of the distillery at the moment on, on the other screen there, as you can see. Uh, it is a seven-year-old Oloroso. I reckon this is going to be really popular. I've had a nose of it now. I've had a taste. Understandably and very deservedly quite popular, this one. I can't get away with that. I can't like, it's like tiny bit of like um, a sugary meringue on the end. Just that, that, that zest, that sugary zest right on the end, like a lemon peel kind of meringue on the end, but really it's just rum cake on the middle. That's a fun whiskey. I, I, you know what? And now I'm going to do something which I, I normally wouldn't do with a sherry whiskey, but I'm going to do it just for you guys. I'm going to drop a water to this. I haven't got much in the glass. I have to be, Tread carefully here. Just a smidge just to um, see how that reacts with a bit of water. Might actually do all right. Uh, 
Rob, I really, Dr. A, because I really appreciate you saying that virtuals are a brilliant addition to the toolkit. It's it's one big m- monthly at the moment. We might look at doing some smaller ones mid-month as well uh, if we've got the um, interest for it. Maybe, like I'm talking like there'd be only like 20 packs out in the wild kind of thing rather than the usual 80 or something. Um, Justin asks, so the dark chromo is more on the nose, less the palette, mate? I mean, the dark chromo is definitely on on the palette. It's like a, uh, it's like a, sorry, a, a ganache on the palette kind of thing going on as well. Uh, praline ganache kind of thing, um, real but really buttery on the on the palate, but the nose is like super clean sherry, which is I'm so excited by that. Like I said before, I mean, if you have a sulfur blind spot, that's great, but if you don't, um, you'll be fine. I mean, this is this is great. There's there's plenty of fruit though now with a with a water like it's I'm talking like papaya. Remember that tech nosing technique we talked about on a live stream ages ago, nosing with your mouth closed and open. So you're almost like inhaling the aromas. Oh, wow, that's weird. I actually prefer it with water. I actually prefer that with a drop of water. Maybe it, maybe I'm getting soft. I just think it's I, I just think it's really um uh with the water, it's really um tropical fruits rather than just rather than just black cake, rather than just mud cake. It's much more tropical. Uh, I'm, f- I'm trying to find reasons to cull my shortlist, but I, uh, but instead it's getting larger. It's getting bigger. Yeah. Uh, look, you know what? My, my, my rule of thumb with Outturn, if, if it's, it's all about picking the, uh, for me, it's always about picking your top two. And then there can be like a, you know, there could be something else after that. You go, oh yeah, maybe that one as well. But it's, you know, just pick out the top two that you're really after. Keep an eye on what I like to call the sleepers in and out term. There are codes. There are always going to be codes that people jump on straight away. Um, but things like 72.97, Royal Nonsense. Whiskey and Almond picked a bottle up, picked up a bottle of that because they're so intrigued by it. Uh, G10.30, the 15-year-old first fill bourbon barrel grain whiskey. That's exciting. And of course, the other grain in there, which I've got on the desk here, Campfire Cookout. I'm going to get to that. But in the meantime, I'm going to let that Welsh whiskey sit for a moment. Drop my out turn. I'm going to talk about something else in out turn. Tar Pit. Tar Pit did make an appearance in one of our virtuals. I saw a comment thread on our group about the um, how how things uh, how, how some members seem to already have bottles of Tar Pit and how did they get them? Uh, who was it that posted the photo? Was it Reza or was it? There was someone who posted a photo of their delivery and in the in the in the middle of their delivery was Tar Pit. It's like how did you already get that? It's not any. It's out this Friday. There was a virtual. We put some on the site for the virtual. Uh, what? That was like two months ago, this virtual. So I've got just a smidge left in this bottle from uh, that event, from the virtual, from the pouring of that. And I'm going to pour a little bit now. Boom. To my glass. We're going to head into the peated territory here. Um, before I even know that, I want to talk about a couple of things um, going on at the moment. Uh, oh, there's the dark chocolate cremo. I did have a bottle photo. Up. There you go. Um there's Ewan Campbell. Now I've talked about Ewan a little bit before. Uh, Ewan is our master, uh, 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 our head of stock, our head of whiskey, if you like. He, he looks after all the um, the projects, the heresies, the um, the procuring of spirit, working with Kai, the director of of, um, of spirit for the society. Uh, he's a, Ewan's just like this alchemist building things in his workshop. And downstairs, I think he's moved it all now, but downstairs in the vaults, Back in like 2017, 2018, there was like Ewan's workshop of goodies sitting in this room of just all these samples and things he's working on that looked a little bit less stylized than this photo, but you can see what I mean. There he is. Um, I also want to just emphasize how much of a um, how much of a mega nerd Ewan is. There he is, like talking to someone about staves, picking out staves for casks to create casks. Like I, I, I keep stressing. The society is not just buying casks wherever we can get them and bottling them. There's a rigorous process, even as early as uh, building out staves, building out cask profiling, and shaping spirit from that. That's exciting. And then oh, some of these photos have shrunk on me. I'm sorry. Let me bring that back up. There he is um, examining some spirit. Uh, sorry, examining some sherry at Spinola there. So examining some um, some sherry from Spinola. Another shrunken photo. My apologies. Uh, examining some giant uh, tons, if you like, over at, at Spinola as well. And there he is, getting his nose into a bung, getting his nose <laughs> into the bunghole of a cask to have an inspection. But what we're going to taste now is a bit of tar pit. 
This is uh, his latest uh, blended malt. Again, just to cover those categories nice and clearly for us all, there's no grain whiskey in this. This is entirely just the, the dressing malts. This is the malt component of a blend. Just like it's like if you took two single malts and blended them together, this is what you've got. You've got a blended malt. He's bottled it at 50%, like the last few as well. Um, he finds that to be the sweet spot, the sweet drinking spot for these releases. A marriage of bourbon hogsheads and selected Pedro Jimenez butts. As uh, Mr. Derbage pointed out in our stream when we talked about this, it's not just any old sort of PX. It even says in the label, selected PX, things that you and us worked on on building up this. We don't list the distilleries listed in this, We just like we don't list them in our normal bottlings. But it's like it, the it's an exciting sort of, I guess, uh, window into the blending. And I said this last night. I personally think that Ewan is getting better and better at building out, um, at, at building these blends, at creating these blends. Uh, the art of blending is one that is uh, always overlooked because it's like you can't learn it. It's like one of those skill sets that's passed down in quietly in family generations that you can't just go and do a blending course. It's 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 a it's a skill set. It's a bit like saying tomorrow that I'm uh, I've decided that I'm going to be a cobbler. You know, it's like you, you, you cobblers are generally sort of passed down family generations of cobblers. So it's one of those things. Yes, you can learn it, but to get it right, you've got to get it right. Now this is this is what I was talking about with you, and he's created something here which is his latest blend that he finds has has excelled. And I know for a fact a number of the blends, another I don't know about this one in particular, but a number of the heresy releases in the past have been like internally coded like batch 14, batch 19, like the 19th version of that blend that he was happy with. So he's made 19 different sampled versions of that blend until he got to the 19th one and went, that's the one. So look, that's really important for us and it still has to go through tasting panel as well. Um, we have loved Tar Pit so far. Another ripper. Yeah, I'm about to nose it. Oh, that's really vibrant. That's really like like uh, cut green grass, cut grass and uh, wood chippings. But definitely a really heavy malt component in there somewhere as well. It's kind of like um like fresh buttered toast. I think even just on the nose, as a certain distillery, I'm almost certain there was a uh, large component of this malt. I'm speculating. I'm speculating. Uh, yeah, and, and Dr. Ecker says the great offerings from 35 continue. Can we just talk about that 35 for a second? This is absurd. This is just crazy. 35.275, a desert island dream in outturn. I don't have a bottle in the office, so I can't taste it. There's only 24 available. Um, it's full maturation for 25 years in a first fill toasted hogshead. What? I mean, we're talking about a, a whiskey from an era of the, I like to call it the uh, ex Glenmo Lumsden sandbox era of making whiskey uh, that both Glen Murray Distillery and Glen Murray Distillery really benefited from and the society absolutely benefited from. And if you remember, if you, if you dial back about five, six years, we were seeing 18, 17, 18, 19-year-old first fill, first fill toasted hoggies of 35. Fast forward five years, they're now up to 25. I don't know how many more of them are going to be kicking around, but they are always absolutely delightful whiskeys. Uh, and I think, uh, and I'm again, I'm, I know I'm, Bias this? I don't know. I honestly think a car strength, single cask, 25-year-old uh, whiskey for 485 is a, is very good value. I'm not going to say it's a steal. It's a very good value. If you can, I mean, 25-year-old whiskey doesn't, that's the thing with whiskey is that the age, the longer the age statement, the dearer that always is, and that's been really extrapolating in the last few years as well. Um, I haven't tasted it, but look, I have tasted a number of those toasted hoggies from Distillery 35, and they're always unreal. Um, I'm feeling spoiled tonight, tasting all the ones I have on my shortlist. Well, Tar Pits, tar pits a no-brainer. It really is. Uh, it's 130 bucks. It's, you know, it's it's supermarket price just about. Oh, God, I just scared myself. <laughs> I thought there was a big bug on the floor or something like a spider, but it was just a, you anyway. um, uh, know. So, Tar Pit, where are we? 50%. 
it's plenty of peat in there, but it's not. Um, I wouldn't say it's like it's not heavily peated. It's not almost like in the lightly peated category. Definite sherry influence on the nose as well. Definitely like that sweet sort of uh, PX kind of influence. Has anyone watched those um, uh, Horst from whiskey.com doing those reviews? And he, you can hear every um, swish of the whiskey in his mouth. I love Horst. I think he does great stuff, but um, I can't listen to the swishing noise. So I try to move away from the mic when I do it. Um, sounds like you have a Willy Wonka of whiskey with <laughs> with you and tasting, uh, taking a wild guess for the spelling. <laughs> it's, it is Ewan with a U. It's U E U A N. Um, but you, you're very close. Um, Jesse, yeah, it is like it's it's Willy Wonka's workshop with you. And, but this is his latest creation with um with with uh with tar pit. And uh, I think screwed up me again here. I'm not gonna try that again. There he is again, actually. One more of you and sorry, you and I know you're not hugely fond of the spotlight, but I think you do marvelous work. Uh, and that's you and on the left with, with the beard, and that's Kai Ivalo on the right, who um is a who's now full-time as our director of spirit at the society. Um, uh, I don't know who the name of the guy in the middle is, but he obviously works at uh, Dal Monarch uh, Dal Dal Distillery. Dal, 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 Dal something. I'm going to get the wording wrong, aren't I? I knew it. Mm, don't worry. I'll get there. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's top it. That's, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about tasting it. Sorry, I should have said. Hmm. Wow. Much more sherried, much more PX influence on the palate than I was expecting, actually. I, I tasted this on the virtual, like I said, but think of like fresh lobster. Really a bit mineralic as well on the nose. Bit of balsamic. Balsamic and fish, fresh, fresh fish. Whiting, I should say. Bit of licorice. Yeah, crab cakes on the palate. PX crab, sherried crab cakes on the palate. Lovely stuff. Hugely drinkable. Very quaffable. Good fun. You know what I mean? Um, his swishing drives us insane. <laughs> I'm not the only one then. I mean, like like I said, there's quite a few whiskey reviewers and and um, I'm not a huge fan about talking about tasting notes. I'm more about the journey and the experience and the flavor, but tasting notes can get a bit sort of like, you know, super, super, super subjective and nitpicky. And someone says, I can taste pineapple. And someone else says, well, I can taste toasted pineapple. And the other person says, well, I can taste tinned pineapple. And it's like, okay. I mean, that's, that's great. And that's great to do proper analysis. But if you're watching, it's like, I mean, someone else swishing and talking about their tasting notes for me is a bit, bit hard work. Uh, I like to take a different approach, as you guys know, which is why you sometimes like to watch these live streams. I appreciate you watching these live streams, by the way, because we get to talk about all these interesting things like this week with the lead up to Outturn. There's so many goodies, and I just wanted to taste some of them in the office and have a chat with you tonight. Um, are you going to sneak in the G15? You know what? We've got time. Let's sneak. If you guys want it, if you guys want me to sneak in the G15, I will. I've got the spare glass for it, so I'm ready to go. Let me put it this way. My final thought on Tar Pit. You've, we've all got that one friend who likes peated whiskey but isn't completely sold on it. They're not sure. They were all, or they're fresh into whiskey. They don't really know their peated whiskeys yet. They've tried Glenfiddich 12. They've tried uh, Russell's Reserve 10. They've tried a few of the core range staples that we all know and love. But they maybe this is their maybe this is their leaping point. Maybe this is their jumping point into peat. It's a very approachable, lovely, sweet and peat. Sherry and Pete, Sherry and Pete. Put Sherry and Pete together and you get a dinosaur on a label. <laughs> Why not? Okay, campfire cookout time. Before I head into campfire cookout, uh... <laughs> okay, all. Tarp it versus the new Offerman offer offering from Triple One. Cast you it. Jesse, I'm afraid there's no Triple Ones in um, in Outturn, but, and I wouldn't hold your breath. Um <laughs> Double Davis still needs convincing on Pete. <laughs> Double Davis. Okay, before I head into this next one, I want to talk a little bit about the distillery. I'm going to bring up full screen so you can see it all nice and clearly. There it is. There's where um, G15 comes from. 
Uh, that is a distillery uh, in Alexandria, in the uh, in Scotland, in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, this one I'm going to be tasting is called Campfire Cookout. It just also happens that the photo on the screen right now is a distillery in the Highlands called uh, Loch Lomond. I took that photo myself when I visited. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that banner so you can all see it properly just for a second. I took uh, we I took that photo myself uh, when I was over there, which was great. Um, there's the still room. Like this, this place is is just a. Uh, I've shown some of these photos before when I've talked about uh, whiskies from this distillery. It's it's basically a, a, a Willy Wonka of. Um, oh, that's my second reference to Willy Wonka tonight. That's well, actually my first reference. That's Jesse's first. Uh, se it's the second reference after Jesse Morgan. Um, this is basically like it's a, a Willy Wonka of uh, of just dis distillation going on in there. What we're looking at there in in the uh, in closest to us in the photo is um is the inch murren stills which are the pot stills with the tall necks and sort of the column necks if you like and behind them are the um uh, are the traditional swan neck stills which would be called Loch Lomond spirit uh this is probably also one of the most complicated distillery setups uh and they run I'm always going to get the number wrong but it's like 13 14 different spirit types out of this distillery here's probably one of the least attractive photos I've ever taken but it was important for me because that there is the column. We're looking at the column of uh, of G15, and this is G15, not eight in outturn. So that's rather cool, right there. Uh, you can see. Oh, what, you might not be able to see on your screen very clearly because it's. In, I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it, and I'll read a little bit of this. It's really fascinating about single grain distillation. So this will apply for G15. We are the only distillery in Scotland to use a hundred percent malted barley for our single grain and produce peated single grain in the same way. By only using 100% malted barley, our single grain develops a unique character and flavor unlike any other single grain whiskey. So our continuous distillation uses the same wash as that which feeds the single malt stills. We take our spirit off the stills at 85% ABV rather than 94 to retain more character in the new make spirit. That for me is very, very cool right there. Uh, taking some comments, G15, thumbs up, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I've already seen those comments. Sorry. Okay. Um, but that's there is single grain distillation for um, for this distillery, which is distillery G15, which is, I'm going to say, Loch Lomond. Um, and it's very cool to see. There you go. There's some more mechanical photos of what it looks like on site, which is which is just rather cool to see. It's, you know, it's a, it's a workhorse sort of distillery. It's, it's not, they, they, they don't really do tours of the distillery so much either. They've, they've got some signage around. I think they're trying to prepare for, to do some tours, but it's it's a it's a bit out of the way to the distillery. There's no other distilleries really near it. Uh, well, not within a sort of you know five minute drive or anything. Um, and there's it's like I said, it's it's a working distillery. There's that sort of gives you a hint of the height of that still. The 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 Ros do still there. That is I'm standing on I think about the fifth, fourth or fifth floor of the distillery and. That just it just keeps going down. So that's like you know it's a massive column still. Uh, so they can produce a lot of spirit out of that. Uh, good question from Dr. Akers. Uh, are the G15s as weird as their one one two one two two one three five siblings, uh, or even their G9 siblings? Hey hey hey! I'd say the G9s are di very very different entirely. That's organic wheat, but this is a this is a malted peated malted barley uh, spirit here. I'd say they're as definitely as weird as the. Yeah, they're, they're just as weird. This is especially in a weird whiskey, sir. So I'm going to open this one up. Um, I think that's the only photo, last photo I had. Oh, actually, I'll just show you one last couple of little things here. That was my uh, my day with Michael Henry, the head blender there at um, at Loch Lomond, where we got. I was lucky enough to be asked to taste through and write some tasting notes and assessment of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different new make samples that were sitting on their table in their blending room, which is his little sort of workshop. And uh, it's it's very cool just to be able to taste through different new make samples, and they've all been they get then watered down I think to twenty percent on the dot, so they could be uh, there there you can do assessment, and then that gives you an idea of how their different setups are right there. So that's uh, that's a bit of bit of madness out of this distillery. G G15. I'm going to open it right now. We're on, we're live right now. Um, let's open this. Here we go. Boom 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 boom. Fresh bottle open, G15.8, a campfire cookout. The name alone has got me very excited. 
I'll grab some of those questions in just a moment. I'm going to pour a dram of this. Oh, wow. It's a fair bit darker than I was expecting. Most grain mm -hmm. whiskey is quite light in color. Um, this has had an additional maturation. It was initial cask was an ex-bourbon barrel, 200-liter ex-bourbon barrel. The final cask was a refill HTMC hogshead. So refill, uh, heavy toast, medium char hoggy. I'm guessing that's what's given it most of its color there as well. Okay, so I'm confused, Matt. If they're using a 100% malted barley, why are they calling it a grain whiskey and not a malt? Really good question, Darren. That's probably a good time to address that. It's out of a continuous column still. It's not going through the traditional way of making malt whiskey through a through double pot still distillation. This is going through a column still. It's, it's like they're treating, it's like they were doing it with corn or wheat, but they're doing it with malted barley. So it they it's... It's technically, I guess it's it's not it's technically a single malt whiskey in a way, but it's it's a grain whiskey, so it's best classified as a grain. Um, I, I, that would be my best answer for it. This is initially quite muted on the nose. It does this doesn't leap out at you. This is really nuanced. Sometimes you're expecting some whiskeys to really sort of as soon as you nose it, like that first one we started with the. Dark chocolate cremeau that just leapt out of the glass. This one is a bit more. Ooh, there's something else going on here. Fifty-eight point two percent. So you should it should have enough stick to really pounce on me here, but it hasn't just yet. For continuous sim, uh, yeah, SWA rules would play a huge part of that. Mark's right. Uh, I didn't want to get too um too bogged down in the in the bureaucracy. Oh, what have I done there? In the bureaucracy of um. Of the SWA, but it is true. And you know what? I am a I am a fan of the SWA, just for the record. I'm a huge fan of what they do and what they represent and how they are there for uh, the protection of that industry and for the growth of that industry. And they they're not as stodgy as you think. Anyway, um, do they just keep adding new wash to the still for continuous distillation? Yeah, they do, James. It's 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 a continual wash process. It's and that's how they keep running it. I, I'm sure they run this one continuously. Um, I don't know if it was actually running when I was there, so maybe not. I need to find out. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so, like I said, not leaping out of the glass immediately, but it is. Mm. Bloody hell. Wow. It's like a bacon drizzle. It's making more sense on the nose now I've tasted it. Oh. Fresh ham. Smoked hams. American hot dogs and smoked hams and bacon drizzle and oh, fatty sizzle of meat on a barbecue. Campfire cookout makes sense as a name, absolutely. A bit of sauerkraut. Fresh sauerkraut. Sauerkraut and bacon on a barbecue. That would, would be the other name for this one. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. That is something else. It's kind of dry on the finish as well. It's like a dry Riesling on the finish. No, not a... Yeah, it is like a dry Riesling on the finish. It's like that uh, sweet wine, but still got like a dryness on the finish. It's bready as well. That's, I mean, bready is is not a is not a um, unique tasting note to grain whiskey. Grain whiskey, as I've talked about before, is the underdog of of the uh, of the whiskey world of Scotch whiskey, especially. People overlook grain whiskeys because they think that they are inferior to malt whiskey, which is totally incorrect. They are just different. They pro they project different qualities. They work at different ages. Uh, they are just—they are a different. They're a different grain. That's all it is. It's a different grain. It's a different way of making the whiskey as well, but it's also a different grain. Um, the cask type used in in grain whiskey. They use sherry butts. They use bourbon barrels. They use hoggies. They use all sorts of things. So it's not—it's not limited to a cask type. It's more limited to the way the spirit is made and the everything like that. It is still somewhat like subtle on the nose. Um, Maybe it's because I've had it after the tar pit. I'm not sure, but the tar pit was obviously a bit more sherried. Um, 
I'm going to drop water, see how that, see how it behaves. Oh, wow. Okay. With a tiny bit of banana bread, um, the pun, sorry, a tiny bit of banana bread, bit of water, slightly coconutty. I can safely say that's just about the oiliest uh, grain whiskey also I've ever had. It's oily on the palate, but dry on the finish. It's got this lovely dry wine finish on on it on the on the end there. That's definitely the kind of whiskey you could pour a a, a biggie a biggie as I call it a biggie of, of this and just sit back and enjoy it and feel like you're at the campfire. You could take this to a campfire and enjoy it. If you are in a state right now which allows campfires, I don't know, then you could really enjoy this as a campfire. Sounds like a winner, says Dr. Akers. I think it is. It's an intriguing whiskey. It's the first time I can think of I've ever had a peated grain. I've tasted thousands upon thousands of whiskeys, tens of thousands. This is possibly the first time I can recall I've had a peated grain whiskey. I should clarify, a peated Scotch whis grain whiskey. Anyway. Uh, are they likely using Baird's peated malt in G15, Matt? I know they use entirely um, Scottish barley for this distillate, but I don't know if it's beds. I'd have to I'd have to dig a bit deeper on to find that one. Um, is there a mat rule of thumb for water in G's? Uh, cask dependent as with malt? Good question, Rob. Yes, there is. I don't mind adding water to, to my grain whiskies. In fact, I encourage it. Uh, even older grain whiskies. We've had some grains, uh, even recently we've had some 30, 35, 39-year-old grain whiskey uh, that has been, it really does benefit from a few drops of water. I think grain actually... Um, Works better with water than even malt, most malt whiskies do, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> you know what? It's funny. Alan Shield says uh, the Berghaus jumper I'm wearing. It's a. It's not a society branded anything. Sorry, it's just a Berghaus jumper. It's just making think of the uh, the wee Neds back home in Glasgow. And I know what you mean by Neds. I'm sorry. I don't. I didn't realize this was a Ned brand because um, it wasn't cheap either. <laughs> And actually, I'll tell you something funny. I bought this just outside of Glasgow. So there you go. <laughs> I I was in Glasgow on one day in 2019 and I was freezing. I didn't pack nearly enough cold clothes because, you, you know, that generally summer in Scotland is kind of like, you know, spring or a cold spring day in Australia kind of thing in Sydney or something. So it's like... Uh, I didn't bring I didn't bring nearly enough warm clothing with me, and I knew it was it was actually the forecast was that it's getting colder over the next five days, and I was heading into Isla and Campbelltown, and I, I knew I needed some more clothes, and I I walked into some like mountain mountain gear you know one of those mountain gear shops that have you know nine hundred pound Gore Tex jackets and stuff, and I was like I don't need some nine hundred pound Gore Tex jacket, and nor can I afford it, but I, I I saw these like this this fit and it was nice it was like this this works. It's like Berghaus, I don't know. I don't know what Berghaus is. I was like, oh, I'll buy that one. It was still like it was still like 150 pounds. Don't get me wrong. So I don't know how many Ned's can afford that, but that's okay. Uh, I appreciate that reference, though, Alan. That's quite funny because I did buy this in Scotland. There you go. Um, uh, Zeno says, "Good to see Zeno. Uh, hey, Matt. If a distillery um, did a run using peated malt and didn't clean or wash the stills and ran a grain or something similar to this, would it fall under a G or?" Does laws come into play, Cal? So if a distillery ran, did a run using peated malt and didn't clean or wash the stills and ran a grain or something similar, I mean, you mean running a grain through a, a malt, through a pot still? I mean, no, I mean, if it, it doesn't matter what's been in the still previously. Let me just preface by saying it doesn't matter what's been in it previously. If they've run like a grain whiskey through a pot still, uh, it, which wouldn't really work. But if they did, uh, it would... Uh, it would still be a great, it would be, it would be a malt whiskey. No, well, it depends what it is. Anyway, that gets complicated, but it, it's, it's true. I mean, it's only what's been through it. So it would be, uh, it would be a grain is always a grain and a malt is always malt. But uh, in this case, it's, it's more to do with the still, uh, which is why it's classified as a grain. If I'll, I'll do you something, I'll, I'll do you one better on this G15.8 that I'm on right now for those who have tuned in. Campfire cookout. I'll do you one better on this. If you had a bottle of this and you pour some for, for a friend, and ask them to ask, guess what it is? No one's going to guess that this is a grain. Not in a million years. 
even the most discerning noses of people you know won't be able to guess that as a grain whiskey. It's no chance. Uh, inspired me to grab a dram of 112.69 Scotch Goes West Indies. That was a good bottling, Scotch Goes West Indies. That was a lovely bottling. I, I did taste that one, but I didn't grab one for myself. Every so often there's a bottling that goes comes and goes and you go, mm, just kicking myself slightly for not, uh, not jumping on that, but you always remember there's something else around the corner. But it's all in the journey. It's all in the journey. Good, good comment there, Rob. And this just G15 is hitting the spot. I remember we actually had G15.1 in Australia uh, a few years back, which was called Sweet Temptation, I think the name of it was, which was just delightful. That was a completely unpeated, uh, very sweet 15-year-old, I think, or nine-year-old. I can't recall off the top of my head, um, which was a, a yeah a single cask from G, G15. And as I've said before, this distillery has five codes with the society. 112, 122, 135, G9, G15. It's, it's got quite, a, cavil, quite a, a broad, diverse list of codes from all the different spirit runs. I could do a whole stream just talking about the spirit runs of this distillery, of course. Before, I, uh, before we call it a night, oh, I was going to show you some extra photos here. There it is. There's the distillery. They've actually got their own cooperage on site. It's not a really cooperage. They don't like to call it that. It's more sort of like a barrel repair center and rejuvenation. They don't really build the barrels there so much. They do a little bit, but it's it's very much a rink. Oh, I guess it is a cooperage then, isn't it? Um, and there's one of their casts getting uh, getting toasted, getting charred. Sorry, toasted in that case. Um, and there's the rather unattractive, just one of the main buildings. It's not exactly a look of this distillery. There's no uh, idyllic gardens or, you know, uh, Swiss visitor center. It's just what it is. Now, some other things coming up this month, of course, which I won't be talking about because I don't have, you know, anyway, I don't have them with me, but I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to show you any more than that because that's what it is. It's magic, magnificent mystery malts, virtual tasting. That's on the 25th of June, the Friday the 25th of June this year. Uh, and that is on sale with the rest of Outturn. And it's five whiskeys that we're just going to keep a mystery and they're going to come in a box and uh, we'll taste through them and you, we'll, we'll, we'll package up the tasting notes with the whiskeys in a separate envelope. And you can decide whether to open it or not. I would encourage you not to, but it, it's going to be sort of a champs themed mystery malts kind of tasting. I can tell you right now that some of the whiskeys we've put in that lineup are truly absurd. And it's just good fun. Why not? Like you don't want to just open it up and be like, hey, every whiskey's sort of in that sort of light and delicate or something. It's like, these are all like, these are some stonking good mystery whiskeys and it's going to be good fun. Like sharing them around and seeing what people think of them. So, uh, and there's the mystery malts. A good question from uh, Mark Teague. The mystery malts are all SMWS. It's five SMWS single casks, five of which have never been seen before, have never been featured before, and uh, and they are five incredible whiskeys. Uh, and I and I mean that we, we've taken we've taken some lengths to make sure of that. Um, that that leaves me for the night. I just want to say thank you so much for um, for tuning in for being a part of this live stream. Always appreciate it because it's it's nothing without you guys watching. And, and enjoying a few drams with me. I hope I've taken you through an interesting journey of dark chocolate, no, dark chocolate. Yes, dark chocolate crimo, which is what we started with, the 128.14 from Wales. Then the Ewan's latest little experiment, the Tar Pit, which is a good, fun, fun whiskey, that one. And, of course, the utterly odd and very enjoyable Campfire Cookout, a peated grain whiskey from G15. I hope you've had a bit of fun with that. Uh, keep an eye on the website for all, always for our events, for our goings-on, for our releases. Outturn is this Friday at midday. You can sign up, of course, as a member to join the society before Friday and you'll get access to Outturn. Always really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. Slash Lanza all uh, and stay safe and far from sober. <laughs> I do not condone that. Uh, and then uh, cheers, Matt, from Alan. Good to see you, Alan. Uh, Alan, you made my night with that comment about my jacket. I don't know if I can ever wear this again, but I really appreciate it. And, um, of course, I will see you all soon. Uh, it's roundtable tomorrow night. Special guest Simon McGorran will be joining us, who's a who's a brother from another mother in in my in my circles, because he's uh, he and I are, I think the only two people who work in independent spirit uh, as ambassadors. And I, I think that's rather cool. Um, night, Matt, Darren. Thank you so much, Darren, for tuning in, and I'll see you all tomorrow night for roundtable. Cheers. Thank you.